Thank you. I'm so sorry I got this presentation to you so late. So I don't see your boss, but she is. She sent an email. That's why I have to silence my phone. It's what? Yeah. Did the Christmas news? Yeah. Lucky. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, good afternoon, everyone. We're going to get started with our presentation today. I'm, I'm very excited. Thank you all for coming um, for another one of our uh, Brown Bag uh, series here at the Public Library. Um, I am Dr. Nathan Tai, professor of assistant or assistant professor of history here at University of Nebraska Kearney, and also the, the organizer of these series, which are held on the second Wednesday um, of every month. Um, a wide range of historical topics, but but this year and and this topic is is going to be very important, as as we'll see. Um, I want to again extend my thank you to the Kearney Public Library for for hosting us for these these wonderful events. We've been doing them for a number of years now. Um, and we're, we're very excited. Um, just to um, put onto your calendars the upcoming talks next month, uh, Carney Creates, uh, which there are a couple members of us here in the audience today, um, are going to be discussing the history of the arts and culture in Kearney um, and the, the digital community history project that, that we have been working on for some time now. Um, and then on March 8th, Autumn Langmire, um, a UNK alum is going to be discussing the history of the Nebraska State Historical Markers, which she is the director of at uh, the State Historical Society now. Um, we have other events, other programming, other, other things. Um, so always um, look to see what we're doing at the history department. Um, our social media, uh, Twitter, Facebook, as well as Instagram and, and, and the like, um, as well as our calendar on our website. But Today, I am very happy to introduce our speaker on Carney's 150 years. Um, Brock Anderson is an adjunct professor in the history department at UNK, as well as the community engagement director for the Buffalo County Historical Society. So in many of these capacities, you probably have also heard him on Talk of the Town, talking about Carney history, been to one of his lectures or his many um, community programs. Brock is, Brock is very involved. Um, he is a Humanities Nebraska speaker for the Humanities Nebraska Speakers Bureau and graduated from Chatham State College with a bachelor's in social science education in 2017. Um, he graduated with his master's degree in history at the University of Nebraska at Kearney in 2022, where his research focused on the social, economic, and political relationships between the Lakota from Pine Ridge and non-natives in Northwest Nebraska during the late 19th century. Like the famed author, Mari Sandos Brock shares the same passion for Northwest Nebraska through his own roots on Pine Ridge Reservation 
and the bordering communities of Gordon and Rushville. He also was the Mari Santos uh, scholar a number of years ago, so he has a lot more in common with Mari. Um, but please join me in welcoming Bronco. Okay, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Okay, and before we get started, um, I'm a very interactive speaker. So, if you don't want to be seen in a picture of for social media on our BCHS page, I suggest hiding your face or duck down or something. <laughs> but we're going to do a selfie to start us off, okay? Okay, I can't get everyone. I'm sorry, you folks over there are just going to have to miss out, unfortunately. <laughs> Okay, are we ready? We're going to say on three, I'm going to go one, two, three, carny, just like that. Uh, all right, ready? Oh, and, and you're going to do a thumbs up, wave your hand up in the air, look like you're having a blast, okay? whether you're enjoying it or not. Okay, ready? One, two, three, carny. There we go. You passed the test. So thank you so much for having me here today. Um, I'm with the UNK History Department, and Nathan, he swindled me into the brown bag lecture the last couple years, and I, I did want to make sure that he had to say Mari Sandoz's name in there because he is a Willa Cather nut through and through. So, <laughs> but anyways, the topic of today is Carney's 150 years. I'm going to be talking about like the 10 cents version of Carney's history because we have a lot. We have a lot going on all 150 years throughout Carney's existence, and then even some before. I'm also going to talk about some of the things going on, events, programming, programming with the sesquicentennial year and the celebrations going to happen. But first, I'm going to propose the question to you folks. Where is Carney? Right in the middle, right? Right in there somewhere, right? Is that all? Is that how you would define Carney? What else defines what Carney is? The interstate in more modern times. The university, the Platte River. Rivers, railroads, are what a lot of communities are defined by within our state. And so... When we think about our place in central Nebraska, in the United States, it's, it's largely going to be defined, nope, there we go, it's going to be largely defined by this geographical space, these people that are coming and going. And prior to Kearney's existence in 1873, when it formally incorporated as a city, we have a whole swath of native peoples that are kicking around. I like this map specifically because um, it, it, it draws out kind of where these native peoples are coming around, but these borders are far more lucid. And how native peoples view and use land is completely different than many of these Euro-Americans that are coming in. So we've got more in our area, the Pawnee, Further out where my research and where I'm originally from in Alliance in Gordon, the Lakota, the Ponca, Omaha, Oto, Kanza, they're all frequently trading with one another. They're warring with one another. They're sharing resources with one another. And so this is what Nebraska looks like where Kearney was prior to the establishment in 1873. Keep that number in your mind, by the way, for later. Okay. And so, what else defines Kearney? It's these trails that come out west. So we've got the Mormon Trail, California Trail, Oregon Trail, Pony Express. The Platte River Road is what it's called. Correct? Not if you agree. Okay. Just a double check. And so, they come through the central part of Nebraska for what reason? Why is Central Nebraska so flat, right? We can see that along I-80 nowadays. There's a water source. It's filled with cholera. 
Not good, especially when Euro Americans are coming through. And this also defines how Carney comes about. So with all these trails and all these people that are coming here and that were here before, my argument is going to be My argument's going to be that this landscape being in central Nebraska is what's going to set Kearney up economically and politically. We also have these other trails in Rose West. So here we have a map, and an accurate map. Can you believe that? You can't always trust the, the documents you see in the past. You can see the outline of Fort Kearney Reserve. Supposedly these rail lines that come here out to the reservation, Fort Kearney Reservation. And then we have this other thing called the Lincoln Highway. Transcontinental Railroad, Transcontinental Highway that continue to come through Kearney. But as we continue going forward, um, we got to take a step back and we have to think about Fort Kearney as one of those main, main proprietors to having the city established. And so Fort Kearney is established 1847, lasts up until the 1870s. Um, and it's going to be near this nearby community of Doby Town, Kearney City, which is going to be the first Kearney technically. It's not incorporated. It's serving as this, this place for soldiers and travelers along the trail that they can get these other goods that they can't typically get at Fort Kearney. That is also a service station for these folks. Kearney, we know, comes from <coughs> film Stevens Kearney. But as far as the name of the city, much more heavily debated. There's a lot of different names going on that deal with Kearney specifically. And the story I like to tell at Trails and Rails, um, when they ask, me, what, how do you say Kearney, Kearney, depending on where you're from, why is it with an E? Why is it with, without the E? Well, the story that we tell at Trails and Rails is the post office got it wrong. Um, phonetically, Kearney sounds like it naturally has an E in there. So um, whoever, however, accidentally put an E in and everyone thought it was just so great that they left it in there and they thought it was funny and that's kind of the story that we perpetuate to our guests when they come in and Diana really emphasized how you say Carney's name okay and so when we have Fort Carney that's established just on the other side of the Platte River there's really not a whole lot of commerce going up further north of the river that's not until the Platte River Bridge is put together. There we go. And so again, when Kearney starts to develop, and the land around Kearney develops is when there's more development north of, of the Platte. So you have the Union Pacific Line that's coming through present day Kearney in 1866. Then you have Kearney Junction between UP and the Burlington line that's created in 1871. A lot of land speculators saw this junction as a big opportunity for folks that this was going to be a town. This is where business is going to be operated one way or another. And so we get to end of 1872, we have about 200 some odd folks kicking around. We incorporate as a village in 1872, and then finally on December 3rd, 1873, we are the city of Kearney. We're sitting at a little over 500, 600 folks at that time. And so Kearney is going to continue growing. Again, I really stress this geographic place because I'm a spatial historian. Then comes the economic and political potential in the 18 late 1870s, 80s, and 90s, 1890s. And one of those folks, George W. Frank, he is largely responsible for 
the folks coming out west investing into Kearney. And these investments are not just, oh, we're going to start a store. It's going to be a small mom and pa shop. It's going to be a general store. I mean, it's, it's infrastructure. It's electricity. It's water. And he's doing this because he's a businessman. The Pawnee were relocated further south into Oklahoma and thus made it just an open land, open for settlement. And so he's able to buy this large lump sum um, from the Union Pacific and investing into this infrastructure that will set up so many of these other businesses, such as the Carney Cotton Mill, Carney Flour Mill, Carney Oak Mill, Carney and Black Hills Machine Shops, Carney Gas Works, City Water Works, Sub Printing Company, Carney Paper Mill, and these are just a few of them. And if it wasn't for these two right here at the bottom, most of these others wouldn't have come. So Mr. Frank Watson, H.D. Watson, is going to be one of those folks that are going to be critical founding members of the Kearney community. Um, if you had atten attended Nathan's uh, Kearney Electric Car presentation, this is my favorite photo. This is my favorite photo, hands down. Especially with the fact that there is an emphasis on the electricity and that Kearney was a progressing city. It was a city that had electricity. It has this plant, this power plant. It's a top notch place to be. And so this is gonna be where this boom period comes into play. Kearney's boom period really is gonna be late 1880s through early 1900. Yeah, you have the Panic of 1893 there that ultimately does away with a lot of the investments that Frank, Mr. Frank had in the community, but um, we still have these structures like the Kearney Opera House that are established in 1891, as well as this courthouse. You see the old one that was stolen from Gibbon. Anyone that are Gibbonites in here? <laughs> A new one. That was really to awe people. The Midway Hotel, the first one. People like Harry Houdini, Carrie Nation. These are the kind of folks that are coming to Kearney. And we were to be this Minneapolis of the West. And so with this boom period going on, you know, it's, it's not just enough to have these businesses, these manufacturing plants, but you're going to have art and culture here as well. So I won't touch too much on what Chuck or the Carney Creates is going to talk about, but the Opera House is one of those pinnacle achievements in the Carney community that's eventually torn down in 1954. And that still continues. Moses Sidham, he comes out to, to Kearney before it was even Kearney in the 1860s. And um, he's got this grand plan that, you know, we're in the middle of the populist movement, populist era, kind of towards the end of the 19th century. We need to move the nation's capital to where the people are. Kearney, Nebraska in the late 19th century. Not very many folks are living out here, but this is what he called for. In fact, specifically, he wanted to finance the whole project by selling off parts of the old Fort Kearney reservation to pay for some of the construction that was going on at in creating the new Capitol buildings. Specifically, the Capitol building for the United States federal government was going to be at the top of Second Avenue, where more or less family fresh is today. <laughs> that happened? No, of course not. But we were still not done with that fact that we were going to be this capital city. In 1911, there was a legislative bill proposed that maybe we move the capital from Lincoln to Kearney. It's more centrally located. The geographic space makes sense to tie in Western Nebraska, but there are some other 
alcohol related quarrels and S.D. Bassett disagrees. He is the legislative representative out here and he even doesn't want it. So in 1911, that's clobbled as well. So if you ever hear the term that we're the capital city, it's because of all these possibilities <laughs> that we could have had. What we were envisioned to have. This Minneapolis of the West. But going into the 20th century, this boom period ends. Why? What have you known to be the ending factor of it all? Panic of 1893? Wheat prices fell through the floor. Wheat price, yep, wheat prices fell through the floor. Nebraska is a largely agricultural state, then and still. These investments stopped coming. People realize how hard it really is to live out here when the wind's blowing 20, 30 miles per hour oftentimes with the wind, blend, the blizzards and the whole nine yards. It's not exactly the most ideal place to stay. And of course the capital and all that, that, that jazz. It's a mixture of all these different things with the market and these, these folks coming to town that just don't make it to be what it was, what people envisioned it to be. But that doesn't mean we still didn't have success as a community. We had these new opportunities. So we had Kearney Normal that was established that would become the State College or the University of Nebraska at Kearney. We have the Kearney Military Academy, the Korean Military Academy. We have the State TV Hospital. And so when all of those more economic aspects are deteriorated, there is still that geographic value that Kearney is in the middle of the state of Nebraska, in the middle of the country, that is that was that is more prominent. We also see a lot more of this tourism and recreation that comes through. So we have specifically out west, we have the 1733 ranch. Um, I'm still looking for a picture of inside the ballroom at the 1733 Ranch. So if any of you have it, I know it's out there somewhere. You just let me know, and I'll make a copy for my museum. But um, had the world's largest barn at one point. H.D. Watson, again, that gentleman, um, critical player early on, owns this ranch. Um, or the Watson Ranch before, but then it becomes a 1733 Ranch. Really going after the fact that Lincoln Highway. We were the midway city. You are halfway between San Francisco, California. And just to make sure you're still awake, what other city? Awesome. There you go. Good answer. Okay. And so that's starting to develop in the 19 teens. We also have this midway amusement park. They have a roller coaster, they have a swimming pool has all these great things just on the west edge of town. When people skiing out at Cotton Mill Lake. So again, highlighting the fact that these new opportunities are coming through. These new investments, despite Carney's economic woes. And then finally we get to the 1940s. And our country is at war with Germany, Japan, and the United States federal government is looking to establish an air base. Kearney is attractive because it is in the middle of the country. Planes um, won't be bombarded from, on the east or west coast, as it was so to believe, less susceptible to attack. And skies are pretty clear generally. Not a whole lot of rain or cloud development happens out here. So Kearney is the choice for this Army Air Base from 1942 to 1949. And you can see the Midway Hotel in the background here. You've got the Soldiers Monument. This is downtown Kearney. Cute little puppies. <laughs> and so it's known as the Kearney Army Air Base up until 1948. Right, Nathan? 1947, um, before it becomes the Air Force Base. And by that time, they have this whole slew 
of, of, of buildings, they have a church, they have these dormitories, they have all these recreational aspects at the airfield that make this a little community in itself. They have a radio station, KGFW has some ties with um, promoting air base news. The whole community of Kearney is directly involved with this coming to town. This brings back Kearney into this globalized stage. This is the very beginning of it. And there's a great video, DVD. We sell the DVD in our gift shop. You can find this on YouTube. Kearney Goes to War um, and describes how certain people have gone about in trying to remember highlighting Carney's history. There's been a lot of a lot of topics, a lot of things done with Carney Army Airfield. Um, several students have attacked this this topic and di digested a lot of different aspects, including morale on the base, keeping morale at a high level. And so once the war ends in 1945, the base continues on for a little bit longer for the B-29 bombers that are there. They are going to experiment more with them, but as the war goes further and further away when the war had ended, um, soldiers are slowly dwindled out and the base subsides. And then we get into this new era. I'm going to call it Carney's resurgence period. I don't want to call it a boom because Carney's first boom was was quick, it was large, large for its scale at the time. But we have this this era where there's increasing health services. We have several hospitals that were established that are growing, such as Good Samaritan Hospital, the WCTU Hospital. We've got um, clinics that are open up, opening up all across town. I think that is the Kearney General Hospital there. And this is all post-World War II. On top of that, we've got a great college that's growing at a very quickly rate following World War II. What's going on here, folks? Vietnam. So we have a large enrollment of students that are coming to Kearney State College to avoid the draft. And then by the current numbers, we're at 4,200 roughly. So we have the college and education that's gonna help Kearney continue to grow and grow beyond just the, the city limits, but into the rest of Nebraska and the rest of the country. And we're continuing that, even with a lot of the construction that we have. So I'll talk a little bit more about that here in a little bit. Those businesses are slowly coming back. We have Baldwin, we have Cashway, we have West Pharmaceuticals. They're all founded in this resurgence period. And again, the increasing tourism. We all know what this little bird is, right? The crane. <laughs> but we have the Trails and Rails Museum. That's established in 1975. The Kearney Children's Museum, further down the road in the 1980s. The Frank House, before it was remodeled. And the Johnsons had lived there for 15 years to, to get it to, to rebuild and to refurbish what that house had. And that's continued. the 21st century. And so what does Carney look like post-2020? Well, as a historian, I'm not one to make so many guesses or um, look into the low ball and see that we're going to continue to prosper, but we've got a lot of construction going on in our community. Just to name a few, we've got the Crown Plaza, We've got the Yanni Park that was established here. There is the, the hospital. We've got 
course, our West Wing of the Family History Center that I have to throw in there. <laughs> Increasingly following what had happened during the resurgence period for Carney's history, focusing on increased health services, tourism, and this globalized business district that manufacturing. And so I'd say the future's pretty bright for Carney if it keeps going on the trend of investing into itself as it had done during the boom period. There's some new laws, regulations that will hopefully work out better this next go round for Carney. Which leads me to Carney's sesquicentennial year. Pop quiz. When was the city of Kearney founded? 1873. 1871, we were the Kearney, we were Kearney Junction. 1872, we were the village of Kearney. So 1873, we recognize as the anniversary year of our community. So we've got, you'll see these tickets every now and then. We're handing them out at the museum. I've got tickets in other Kearney cultural partner entities that, that will have these hopefully in their rack card holders. And as far as events coming up, this brown bag lecture fits right into the start of the celebrate, celebratory year. This Friday, we have Carney's first VIPs. That's at 2 o'clock. And that'll highlight a lot more of these founding members of Carney that were critical in establishing our community. <clears throat> There's a nice 150 display, if I don't say it myself. Um, that's going to be down there on the main floor through the end of February. We've also been collecting family histories over the last two and a half years. If you haven't gotten them in, you have about a week before I start really telling people no. So we're actively collecting family histories. There's the Carney Cent Cent uh, the Centennial book, the 125th book that we're going to be adding to. We'll be publishing at the end of this next year, so it'll be the BCHS sesquicentennial book, end of 2023. And as far as February, we're gonna have the Carney 150 exhibition that'll be through the end of December, mid-December. We also have an exciting exhibit called the Bison Exhibition. It will highlight a lot of those native peoples that were before Carney, the land, the resources, the bison, all of that political, economical center. And then if you wanted to know more about some of these details that I've been talking about, again, you're only getting about the, I said the 10 cents version. It's, I, I think it's more like the five cents version since we've got so much history. I'm teaching a couple of senior cl college classes um, in February going into March as well. So. That's for the next couple of months. We also have other entities that are partnering in this effort as well. In March, there's going to be a Chautauqua with Fort Carney DAR. DAR is also going to do a time capsule unveiling in June 18th or 19th. So a lot of things going on. But as far as BCHS events, projects that are the big ones, I mentioned the Sesquicentennial Centennial Book Project. There's going to be a Carney 150th birthday party, June 24th, downtown Carney. It's going to focus on this. There's two sides to it. There's going to be the, the more family-friendly version during the day. And then at night, there's going to be your kind of downtown Carney of the Bricks kind of theme, whether it be in the, one of the two parking lots down there or however um, downtown Carney on the Bricks is going to do it. But... June 24th is the official day that we're going to start recognizing that that big celebration, largely because December 3rd might be a little chilly, as we all know. And even then, kind of towards the beginning of June, end of May, that's where you're going to see a lot more of these wagons clear back in the 1850s, 60s, when it came through Carmen. Um, there's going to be a Pioneer baseball game. Thank you, Nathan, for that fabulous idea, by the way. That's going to be played on July 23rd between the Buffalo County Historical Society and the Stir Museum. <laughs> be a fantastic. I won't be the one that will be out there on the field. I might be a coach or a moderator. I don't know. But that will be a fun-filled event that will honor 
some of Carney's baseball history. And then last but not least, we have our From Beyond the Grave Cemetery Tour. That'll be September 3rd, October 1st, and October 2nd. So if you haven't attended one of our From Beyond the Graves, it's now going into its fifth year. This last year, we had done it at Elm Creek. We highlighted the McCartney family, and we went through their family as the, the, the founding pioneers that came out here, then their children, then their grandchildren. Well, we're going back to this idea of a cemetery tour as a celebration of, of Carney's 150th anniversary, like we had done with Gibbons, sesquicentennial. Okay? And so with all of that, I know I'm very, very quick, I do want to mention that I'm also a board member for the Kearney Public Library Foundation. There's this exciting program um, about comic books, superheroes, and World War II by James Kimball. He wrote Prairie Forge. It's about the scrap metal drive here in Nebraska. Very well done book. Highlights a lot of the efforts during World War II. You can get a lot of great information from him about that book, as well as this new one about um, comic books and superheroes at that time. I want to leave about 15 minutes for about that's, questions. That's tomorrow. That's tomorrow. Excuse me. Same, save that channel. And bring January 12th at noon. So same time, same place. Same place. Same, same place. room. Resort so with that, seats. I want to thank you guys for letting me come talk to you. I want to thank Nathan for allowing me to come talk to you. Um, and I hope to see you at one of our awesome sesquicentennial events. See you. Go back about two slides. Um, that Friday's VIP is that oh. open to the public? Yes. Where is that? Yes. Where is it? And At Trails and Rails Museum. It's in the West Wing. So if you go into the Family History Center, it's at 2 p.m. Um, our two guest speakers are Lisa Atchison and Pat Knapp. They had a great KCLC project where they had. That's, they'll be talking about that project specifically and the tombstone rubbings that they had done a year and a half ago, um, highlighting these these Carney founders, if you will. So, yeah, yeah. Korean Military Academy. I've never heard of it. Yeah. What the heck was that? So, and again, I can go on a tangent. So, so whenever Dan, I am talking. We don't have that. Okay, <laughs> but the Korean Military Academy. Um, we had several folks such as Kwon So Lee, um, Henry Chung, kind of the bigger names that would have been in cahoots with Kearney Military Academy, Korean Military Academy, um, before that goes on down into Hastings. And so um, Henry Chung kind of being this one individual that is um, more widely discussed because of his notoriety after he leaves Kearney. He becomes the, um, the, the, the president of, uh, of the of Korea that's in in high so at one point I can't remember the exact term but um, he he's educated here in Kearney they they have uh, military operations at this Korean military academy for the eventual overthrow um, of Korea and so it, it's 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 like this little terrorist group that's right here in Kearney because <laughs> the United States doesn't side with this but it's, yet it's here in Kearney um, where community members know about it and they talk about it and they respect a lot of these folks, specifically Henry Chung and Kwon So Lee. So I'll leave it at that. I'll talk more about that. Um, or there's a Buffalo tale about that too. You can find on our website at www.bchs.us. So is that during World War II? Uh, it's gonna be during, Kind of before World War One, around World War One. Other questions? Yeah. Do you know the location of the uh, amusement park in West Kearney? The Midway Amusement Park? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It's just going to be just to the west of the 1733 Ranch. It's where the hot uh -huh. mill was. Other part. Yeah. I'm surprised you didn't mention. The importance of the air base and the new project at the, at the museum. The air base and what? 
the new project at the museum. The new project at the museum. Are you talking about the school? The schoolhouse. Oh yes. Thank you. So we do have again like everything going on in my life. We're going 100 miles per hour. We're reserving Buffalo County history, and we've got this exciting move of uh, schoolhouse district number 23, Sunflower School District, that we're moving from. Where is Haven's Chapel? North of Kearney, that building, if you drive by, is detached from the chapel itself, and it's going to be moving towards Trails and Rails Museum, hopefully, here in the near future. So, um, and that project is specifically geared towards honoring the Kearney Army Airfield. So, how we're going about behind the Family History Center and the Trails and Rails Museum, we have our pioneer. I'm going to say Pioneer Village. We have our Pioneer little village that we have there. And then on the other side of that back property, we're going to have more of a focus towards the 20th century. So you're going to have the 19th century represented, as well as the 20th century behind the Family History Center. Because we're a growing museum. We just established the Family History Center in 2017. That East Wing and that West Wing was finished up now two years? A year. Yeah, year, year and a half. So that's that's one big project that we've got going on. We also got a big old digitization project that we're going to be tackling here in the near future, where um, we, we received a grant from um, from the Pino grants that we got that we're going to start digitizing a lot of our photograph collection and have that accessible on our website. Don't quote me when. That'll be, but hopefully I'd like to start that project this year. So we've got a lot of great potential. We've got a lot of balls up in the air. And I'm stretched thin about every different way that you could think of in getting all that done. Other questions, whether it be about events coming up or Kearney's history. Yeah. I might just add one comment related to the air base. <clears throat> there are many air bases here in the state of Nebraska. Yep. Uh, one of my uncles was a B-29 pilot during World War II, and he was actually stationed at Harvard. But one of the things they did here at the Kearney Air Base is they used it as an embarkation point. What, they, what he did, as an example, along with other flyers, they would come here to Kearney, and this is the spot where they would outfit, and they would fly from here to fly their own planes over to Tinian, uh, in that case. And so that was one thing that was a little different about this base, is that they would bring folks from other bases around the state, and then use this as the embarkation point. Uh, he mentioned that to me one time. Yeah, Nebraska in general is huge for World War II. Between the Hastings Munition Plant, Alliance, where I'm from, had its own air base as well. Fort Robinson was used as um, a training facility as well during World War II. So Nebraska was highly sought after for its World War II manufacturing and training. Ainsworth? Yeah. I think if I'm correct that what now serves as the Bethel Christ Lutheran Church was once a chapel at the airport. Yes, it was. Um, there's one structure that's still standing at the airport today that is the airbase, and it's a hangar. Now, there's a few others kicking around, too. I know. Nathan and I have talked about it a little bit. Structures all over town. Structures all over town. And that's the cool thing I have as a as a person that's not from Kearney, but yet I'm an active person in preserving and retelling Buffalo County history. Is I get to kind of see and listen to you folks about what's important in Kearney's history, and also have some of my own opinions by looking at what we've got in the past and formulating a different perspective on, on our local history. Yeah. Are there any descendants of George Frank living that you know of that we could maybe invite for the 150th? Not here in Kearney. Um, George Frank, that whole family had a very, very hard life um, kind of towards the end of, of their time here in Nebraska where I believe it's a son that had committed suicide or found dead in a Lincoln hotel. Um, Phoebe Frank dies um, just as 
the Panic of 1893 is starting to feel its effects out here in Kearney, um, where George Brain tries to, in order to avoid bankruptcy, put the house in their name and a few other things. So it doesn't go well for the Brain family, and I don't believe there are any descendants. Um, I do know um, one, there are descendants. Yeah, are. Where are they at? Are they in New York? April, where are they at? Uh, there's most of them are in New York. Okay. George Frank and uh, his whole the whole Frank family is originally from New York. Um, because yeah, George Frank is actually in his about his fifties when he moved out here. Because yeah, as Brock talked about, you know, the Carney area was so appealing for development. It just was irresistible to him. So he actually moves from New York to come here. And so eventually, George Frank and his daughter Jeannie and her family moved back to New York. And there are some descendants that live in New York, as well as a few that are in California. And I actually am in contact okay. with uh, two of them. So I'm, I, yes, yeah, we can definitely talk about seeing if we could, because they pass through the area fairly often, like not, uh, not super often, but every so often. Oh, they pass through the area. So Is your know. parade grand marshal now? There you go. Yeah, there definitely are a lot. And there is a second Frank house here in Tinley, but it belonged to, to the Sun that was um, just off of off of campus to the east. Any last questions or comments? Yeah. Do you know when the, when you showed pictures of those uh, troops of four, in 42, 1942, there was a plane back there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know what? You're there. Was that a statue there? I mean, was this? Yeah, yeah was statue. a soldier statue. No. Oh, was the airplane. airplane. <laughs> it was a P-38. A real plane. Was that the state, that plane bolted down there for a while? It's a parade. It's a what? It's a parade. It's a parade. So they parade that plane. Yeah. Oh wow. P-38 or something. Hopefully, they didn't take off. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I, I just curious. The statue you know, probably would have been out in the way towards the north. I don't know how much they would have run into in the south. Do you know when the old soldier statue was was, was put though in, in on Forty Fifth Street on that on that Highway Thirty? When was it established? Yeah. Nineteen sixteen. Nineteen? Huh? Nineteen oh eight. Off by about eight years. Okay. <laughs> It stood in the middle of the street for years, and, yeah, yeah. and drunks on a Saturday night would run into the pants. <laughs> and, and in the 50s, they built a that. candle around it for Christmas. Yeah. And, uh, Where is it now? Uh, so I remember it finally. In Junction Park, just it's south of the track. Right over yeah. there. My very unpopular opinion would to uh, put a roundabout at Central Avenue and Highway 30 there and put that statue right back where it belongs. <laughs> But I think I have a lot of people upset with me. But no, I think it's it's good where it's at now. I, I really, I personally support the fact that it stays downtown because that's that's where its creators wanted it to go. Yeah. And that's where the heart of our community is. Thank you. Yeah. I always wondered what the people here. So early on, I mean, you talked about those trails that came through. That's going to be a lot of folks that are passing through, but it doesn't mean we don't have folks that stay back or come back. Um, Sarah Oliver. Um, the Sarah Oliver story is really a fascinating history. It doesn't deal with Kearney specifically, but um, she was, um, her and her husband coming across the Atlantic um, via the, the Mormon Trail, and a story is told that she they, they broke up a, a wheel or an axle just outside of Wood River Center at the time, and she told her husband, I am not moving another foot forward. <laughs> so, anyways, that's there's, there's that dynamic, but there's also, again, the, the, the major part that people are going to be coming out here and settling is when the railroad's established and all of these other land grants come available. 
So that agricultural part, even though it's not so much mentioned here, is still a big part of Carney's history. Yeah. Can I make just a couple comments related yeah. to that? Nebraska Center is where Shelton is now, the eastern side of the county. And part of what the land grants were is that the way they set up originally that in 20 miles of the Union Pacific track, they gave odd numbered sections to the Union Pacific. You go down to the courthouse, you can see where an odd numbered section to the patent from the US government to the Union Pacific, the even numbered sections. You look at the homesteads that are called patents that are coming directly from the federal government. And then they're the Union Pacific advertised for people to come out. There's some famous advertisements, one of which is at the Trails and Rails Museum and the depot, uh, which is the Shelton Depot down there. And uh, so they wanted people to come out because it was a win-win for them. A, they would they could trans get the people transported out here, but then once they're here, then there were things that could be shipped out, shipped in on the railroad. Uh, so it was an economic incentive for them as well. Well, thank you, folks. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Have a good one.